slow motion. Why? Okay. The first of three major Sonic Frontiers updates recently laid itself upon us, re-sparking some interest in the game post-release. And it's not too shabby. Like the main game, it has some caveats, lacking the bulletproof AAA polish we want for this character. I've made a new friend, it seems. But the good intentions are on full display, as these additions are only positive. Nothing else broke on the way over here, as far as I'm aware. Fingers crossed. All right, now that was just funny. First up is photo mode. At any point during standard gameplay, so not cyberspace or cutscenes, you can open up photo mode from the menu and move it around to get a nice shot. This is gonna make creating thumbnails a heck of a lot easier, and it's fun trying to get that perfect angle, although it is pretty bare bones. The filters are nice, but there are only seven, and they don't even have names. It's not a major complaint or anything, I'm just curious why they stopped at that number. Like, I'm sure it can't be that hard to program, so if you're already going out of your way to create an entire mode centered around taking photos, you might as well go all the way with it, right? Maybe a saturation slider, brightness, exposure, anything that a smartphone camera has had for the past 10 years. Moving it around is a bit cumbersome as well, often getting stuck on the terrain and offering a zoom that doesn't go very far. So if you want a high quality close up, you have to catch Sonic in a cool pose during gameplay and pause at the right time, because there's only so much you can do afterwards. It's a fine mode and I'm glad it's here, can certainly get the job done, but I don't see many people getting lost in this nearly as much as if it had more extensive features. You can't even save the pictures in-game, you have to take a screenshot if you want to keep it. Thankfully, Steam has that feature built in, but... I'm sorry, how do you make a photo mode without the ability to take photos? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see anything here that tells me how to snap a pic and save it to an album. Next up is the jukebox, which should honestly be a mainstay given how musically gifted this franchise is. You can toggle it on and off in the options and press right on the D-pad to cycle through a starting list of 13 songs to listen to while you run around. Hold right on the D-pad and a larger menu will open for you to freely select the song of your choice. You can have it play in order, shuffle, or loop your favorite tune if you want to let the speed mend it for all of time. Throughout every island are sound memories, the rainbow music notes from generations that you can set a waypoint for on your map to easily locate. Each one gives you a new song for a grand total of 53, about the size of a full soundtrack. Although, like the filters, I have to ask, why stop there? It's a great selection, don't get me wrong, but given how much music there's been and how little space sound files take up nowadays, I have to wonder if asking for more is reasonable. And if Guardian fights could have their music replaced as well for consistency's sake. I don't think I've ever experienced a more tonally jarring jump scare than when approaching Tank. Either way, I'm quite pleased with its incorporation. This is going to be a lot of fun for people to try swapping out to different moods, especially if they wanted something more upbeat in the vein of traditional Sonic. The selection itself clearly had some thought put behind it. Kingdom Valley on Kronos, Misty Lake on Rhea, right by the waterfall. A lot of these music notes are placed in areas that you could have easily skipped over in your playthrough. Like the top of this tower on Kronos that seemed too perfect to not have anything up there. Well. Now it does. The far sides of Uranos contain goodies, and Rhea Island, a map that you had no prior reason to explore outside of curiosity, is now home to a lot of essential songs. Some in quite creative locations, like the underwater ruins. This was always a standout section to me, so I'm glad I finally have some incentive to head over. And what do we get for it but the E3 version of His World, the greatest song ever made. There were a few quality of life changes as well, like how you can toggle the power boost animation to not play every time you reach max rings. That was nice to see, I'm never changing that. Apparently cyberspace control was changed a little bit too, but had someone not told me, I wouldn't have noticed because... Honestly, I still don't. You can also disable the Starfall slot machine from showing up, but... This is a weird change because it doesn't actually fix what was wrong with it. The reason we were annoyed is that it blocked our view while we played, so we just wanted a way to minimize or move it. Disabling it entirely means that we also don't get its benefits, creating a new disadvantage. And once it's on screen, you can't even turn it off midway. You have to do it preemptively or else you're stuck with it. Unless you're able to trigger a cutscene, hit a loading zone, or quit out and change it in the menu before reloading your file. Of course, now that I know how to manually stop the rotation, I'll be standing still for most of it anyway so I can max out my purple coins and no more than three starfalls. I'm serious, it's a legitimate skill to try and get three in a row. The timing is so specific, yet consistent to where you can pull it off with practice, automatically making it a more fun mini game than the other casino themed one. Once I have 999 coins, I mean, geez, I just grind and cash out on Uranos. I went from level one to fully maxed in an instant 
And that was a good feeling. Especially because the greatest quality of life update is allowing the Elder Coco to upgrade as many levels as possible at one time. And seeing that was catharsis. Typos are still here though, gotta love it. That's pretty cool, and so you are, Hermit. And so you are indeed. The meatiest parts of this update, however, are the new challenge modes. Cyberspace Challenge is a simple level-to-level -level sequence where you're given a rank after each one, and a final rank after completing them all. This is entirely based on time, so if you were able to easily get an S rank in standard gameplay, then you'll probably nail this first try. That's what happened with me, and I even made quite a few mistakes here and there. Withholding any homing dash usage as well, since I had a feeling that these times wouldn't be designed with that in mind. In fact, the game now acknowledges when you use the homing dash by putting an asterisk on your time. It's still a valid run, but it's the game's way of reminding you that you had some assistance. You rotten, filthy cheater. There's a separate category for each island, and then an all-levels mode where you play all 30 back-to-back, -back, egg shuttle style. Kinda repetitive when you do it in one sitting, but it makes sense. I was just a little disappointed that there was no extra stipulation, like a ring bonus or red star ring count. It wasn't so much of a challenge as much as the game just asking me to play through cyberspace two more times like I already have been. Albeit in one go, which is inherently more difficult. Not to mention most people haven't replayed these nearly as much as I have, and so they get to keep their sanity. Alas, I'm glad that the mode exists in any capacity, and achieving all S ranks will grant a special reward. You get a Medal of Accomplishment on the title screen and unlock the Power Boost for Cyberspace. Now this isn't the speed fix we would have hoped for, it's still pretty slow in those long stretches of running, only shaving off a few seconds at most, but the air boost is more effective and rail launching is significantly enhanced, feeling more like how it is in the open zone at least in 3D. The 2D sections are still numbingly tepid. I don't even think it makes you faster. In fact, the only thing it does make me is upset. Still, I think having it enabled does improve cyberspace enough to justify its unlockable status. For 3D anyway. The other challenge mode is Battle Rush, a series of fights against all the enemy types on each island, then like before, all islands back to back in one massive gauntlet. It's not quite the Titan refight mode people wanted, but it's pretty close, and a boss rush really should be included in any game that has bosses, so this is only a good addition. Gives you a chance to re-experience that ghoulish camera. Wow, that is... Oh, please stop. Please. Sonic, please! Please! Once again, though, you're ranked purely on time, so all that matters is how quickly you can dispatch everything in front of you. That's all well and good, but this means that the combat issues from the main game carry over. It's not about getting creative with your moveset, it's picking the strongest attack with the shortest animation and spamming that on everything. Only changing if the enemy type requires a different approach, like a Psyloop. And there is some satisfaction in a Mega Man boss weakness sort of way where you find the trick, like how Recovery Smash is a tower's living nightmare. Just run up, get hit, press A, and- <laughs> Or how it's more efficient to dodge around instead of parrying because it's faster. Psylooping a group of shield enemies to disable them, then dodge canceling the end of your attack animation to save time, running up to Squid and making him implode. Mother of God! There is depth when you look for it, a little more than what I gave credit to in my review, but it doesn't fix the fundamental issues present, nor does it go nearly as deep as other games in the genre. Further convoluting this are the RPG elements. When selecting Battle Rush, your stats are carried over from whichever save file you choose, meaning there is a spectrum of combinations for what level Sonic can be. Fully maxed out? Maybe somewhere in the middle? Level 1? Full defense? No attack? All speed? No rings? There's a lot to consider here, assuming you have the file to support it. But let's be real, who's not going to play this fully maxed out on their first try? This is Battle Rush, after all, a test of your skills. You want to stand the best chance you can, right? You spent all that time leveling up for a reason? Of course you're going to go all in. As far as you know, that's how the mode was meant to be played. But doing that will guarantee the S rank in a way that further reduces the need for all that clever innovation. I cleared everything first try without giving it much thought, spamming the same combos, trivializing the early game content especially. Look at Ninja on level 1. Versus 99. 
Oh, now come on! This puts us in a weird situation where we have to limit ourselves to make the mode better. Instead of being well balanced by default or having an adaptive ranking system that corresponds to your stats, we have to fiddle around with settings and values to uncover what's most fulfilling for us. On one hand, it gives you options, the luxury of choice, but on the other, there's a strong lack of clarity and decisiveness on the game's end to give me a well thought out experience. To make the S ranks more meaningful, I have to self impose restrictions, but how far do I go? You try doing it on level 1 attack, and it seems impossible for later islands. Apparently it's not, people have done it, but how many hoops am I going to have to jump through to figure that out, and will it be fun? Those are risks I don't know if I have the time or desire to take, and that is the price of putting too much freedom in the player's hands without proper conveyance. So far, my results have been moderately positive, some encounters being greatly enriched by this limitation, like Red Pillar, finally someone who can tell me the truth. The recovery smash does so little damage at level 1 that it actually becomes more optimal to run up and dodge the spinning wheel to get to its head faster. Then I swap to a ranged attack when it gets too close and I repeat. Very satisfying S rank to achieve, but very little of it felt intentional, and with that, you can have some jank. Those quirks in the combat like accidental moves, homing reticles not showing up, input delays, domesticating wolf, it all becomes exacerbated under this strict criteria. There's a lot of trial and error to figure out what works, and I have no problem with that philosophy so long as my mistakes are evident but that's not always the case. Overall, I think Battle Rush is a fine mode that deserves to be included, but is no more polished than the content it isolates. If nothing else, it's still a convenient way to fight all the enemies one by one to test your efficiency at varying degrees, and in that regard, it does its job well. Just keep in mind that the ranking is lopsided. If I may suggest a superficial quality of life update, let us choose what time of day we fight in. Some of these bosses look really good at night, and I think players would appreciate the option. Also, careful when selecting Chaos Island, because you know who shows up right off the bat nearly punched a hole in my desk like the cyberspace challenge you're given a reward for getting all s ranks here however this is no mere menu toggle we're granted an entirely new mode in extreme difficulty this can only be selected when starting a new game and can't be changed midway like the others. Enemies are allegedly harder, although I didn't notice a difference. Sonic is unable to level up his stats outside of the skill tree so you're stuck at level one and taking a single hit will result in death. Trying to grab this vault key that for some reason won't let you touch it? Get clapped, idiot. Naturally, the stakes for every combat encounter are much higher now, since any small error can be fatal. Fixing the core issue with rings and how you only needed one to survive and could continually pick the same ones back up or siloop the ground for easy access. None of that is applicable anymore, and it's one of the two things that Extreme Mode greatly improves upon about the base game. Unfortunately, it also throws the game's balancing way out of whack, even more than it already was. In regards to combat, yes, it's an instant kill now, but you still have a busted parry that can be held well in advance. Or how parrying after a hit can suspend you in midair, negating your damage animation, sparing your life. Don't like jump rope? Go get a snack. These two features alone break so much of the intended challenge to where the majority of my deaths we're just plain stupid. Instead of locking onto the enemy right in front of me, it chooses the one off screen that happens to be surrounded by spikes. I want my lawyer. Extreme really is a good name for this mode because it doesn't necessarily make everything harder. It accentuates the polarizing extremities in the Frontier's balancing act. Like how certain enemy telegraphs, or lack thereof, are really problematic now. Fighting Kunoichi like always, and then you know what? laser. There's another laser on Caterpillar that just feels engineered to cut you off right when you switch rails, unable to course correct. Sonic's squiggly spider sense is nearly impossible to see or hear when you're right up in a titan's face, wailing away with your own particle and sound effects. Made extra confusing by the one attack that doesn't kill you because it plays into a cutscene. Some guardians behave like this too. Tower's spinning wheel doesn't hurt, but everything else does. How about dying in the open zone? Did that ever happen to you in standard play? Look, I don't mind getting killed instantly if the fault is clearly my own, but the occurrence is so random and sporadic, there's no rhyme or reason. It'll show up for two seconds, and then you might not see anything like it for hours. I never died to an open zone challenge. I never took damage until Chaos Island, and it was one part, a part I usually quite enjoy, but the lasers have no telegraph. There's a brief sound cue, but no visual windup to warn of its activation or positioning. And they don't exactly stand out against a dark background of identical lights. The worst part, though, is that dying to those resets me to my last save point at the cyberspace portal beforehand. So I have to redo all that stuff again. It's only roughly a minute, but if you fail multiple times, 
that stacks up. And look, if you're familiar with my videos, then you know that I'm no stranger to redoing content from a fatal mistake if it's part of the challenge. In fact, I've often encouraged it. But this... This isn't a challenge. It's a series of scripted thrills that are meant to feel good and look cool. Making me repeat any of that will diminish its appeal almost instantly. Thankfully, there is a checkpoint right in the middle of this section, if you can walk forward a couple feet. It's just too bad they respawn you directly on one of the laser holes. What? Are you kidding me? It's not even a consistent firing rate. Sometimes you have a second to get out, others it's immediate. Fine tails, yeah, I'm trying. Checkpoint placement was an issue in my first playthrough, but the review is already so long I decided to shelf it. It's time to break the silence. The way this game autosaves is an anomaly. After a major event or mission makes sense, but grinding memory tokens for the absurd final Uranos cost only to trip over some spikes, which on extreme will kill you, and be reset six whole tokens, is deflating. Maybe the manual save fixes this, but I'm not gonna preemptively do that after every step I take, nor should I have to. If you wanna reset my spawn point, go for it, but let me keep the items I've collected at least. It's especially entertaining when it can't make up its mind on where to put you. I left a cyberspace portal, ran up the mountain, died to some spikes, and respawned back at the portal. Makes sense, it's not very far away. But then I went the same way, getting launched by the terrain, classic Chaos Island moment. I went too far, fell in the pit, and it respawned me on the mountainside. I thought, oh, that's convenient, puts me a little closer. So I get launched again, entering a 2D section in 3D, another Chaos Island trademark. Get hit by spikes, and I'm back at the portal again. What? This is not a major inconvenience, but... What happened? On a side note, I've actually come around on Chaos Island quite a bit since my first exposure. I still have the same issues with it, but I've learned my way around and came to enjoy a lot of its platforming. Maybe I don't need to purchase that firearm after all. But I'll window shop. So yeah, the combat still isn't where it needs to be. Aspects of it are definitely improved, but some pretty game-breaking exploits are retained. And now we have these random moments in the open zone affected by the extreme difficulty, even though virtually nothing about the open zone is meant to be difficult. Climb all the way up this tower on Rhea, but got hit by those spikes at the very end because you boost faster than your rail switching animation can keep up? do it again. Another aspect that gets pretty shut down on extreme mode is the assortment of collectible items. While you can still obtain them, Cocos and Seeds of Power and Defense have no purpose since your stats are locked at level 1. The HUD is even disabled. Now this has its advantages. Late game enemies won't get steamrolled by a maxed out Sonic, but now all of those open zone puzzles and mini games that granted a seed for your trouble have greatly reduced value. They still create fast travel rails and uncover parts of the map to help locate guardians and portals, but you can definitely feel that a portion of the game's currency has been gutted. I don't even bother maxing out the skill tree, since the three story moves you get are all you really need. Once I got the quick Psy loop, wild rush, and cyclone kick, I never looked back. And you know what? My combat experience was actually a lot more seamless, now that I wasn't accidentally doing the homing shot all the time. God bless. Although it did mean that I was fighting those common enemies even less than before, since they weren't going to drop anything I could use outside of the rare memory token or portal gear. Which is a shame, because I'm much less bothered by the shields now than when I first played. Getting good can be a very real prescription, except when the terrain is comprised of failure. Running over these stones can disrupt a psi loop at any time it feels like it. Alright, try it again. Nope, okay. Come on. Dude, enough of the freaking cactus. Just draw the circle, okay. Close it. Close it. This is pain. Ironically, even though rings have zero meaning on extreme, dying in one hit meant that I always respawned at 400, so I never had to spend time psi looping the ground to get the power boost back. And that alone was kind of worth it. Despite half of the collectibles losing their meaning though, the other half is made a lot more necessary. And that's because Big's prices have been modified by Mr. Krabs himself. They just added a zero to everything. 150 tokens for a single vault key. Not even Big the Cat's alternate dimension fishing hole is safe from inflation. Honestly, I think they should have disabled the shop entirely. That would have been the most hardcore thing to do, since players can still technically grind the soothing fishing game as long as they want, but jacking the prices up is equally funny and deterring in its own right. Needless to say, I didn't bother with any of it. I already fished everything out once. I don't need to do it again, hammerhead shark aside. And because I wasn't cheating with our purple feline friend, I had no choice but to pay attention to where all the guardians were and fight them without taking damage, so I could get enough portal gears to unlock cyberspace. And speaking of which, this is the other thing that Extreme Difficulty nailed. In fact, it's my favorite part of the entire mode. Sonic Team went back in and lowered every time requirement for the S rank. 
except 1-2, because of course. Now, I've played these levels so much, to an unhealthy degree if I'm being honest, that I was still able to get most S ranks on my first try, but not by much. With a few exceptions, I was mere seconds away from needing to try again, and that's with me taking the optimal routes and not taking any damage. 2-7 and 3-3 in particular were the standouts that had me replaying a few times, only to barely skate by. I should also mention that I disabled the power boost and didn't use any homing dashes to keep it fair, so you could still use either for an advantage. With all that information, though, I firmly believe that this is how the time requirements should have been normally. You can still get three vault keys per level by doing the easy mission, you'll just have to find more portals. Whereas the skilled players who can achieve those tough S ranks will not only get a fourth key, but an extra three for clearing every mission. So at most, they'll only have to play three, maybe four cyber stages per island to unlock every vault. A sizable incentive for going that extra mile. The worse you play, the less you earn. The better you play, the more you earn. This is basic balancing, and extreme mode shockingly understands that better than the others. At least when it comes to the guardian vault key relationship. Everything else is still either the same or worse. Like, they changed all the S-Ranks, but not any of the minigames in the open zone. Except for the Chaos Emerald missions where you had 3 HP. Now you only have one to keep in line with the one-hit KO philosophy. Although not for the hacking minigame, I guess they forgot about that one? Same with Pinball, but that's probably for the best. I was terrified that I was gonna look in that top right corner and see, like, 10 million points or something absurd to troll us, but... Thankfully, they showed mercy. No change to the final boss, either. That was kind of weird. Seemed like a good opportunity. Overall, I'm rather mixed on extreme mode. I like the attempts it makes at a higher difficulty. More threatening boss encounters. I actually had to fight Supreme. Big's fishing isn't nearly as broken, and cyberspace is the best it's been. We really need a way to select extreme in the arcade or challenge mode. However, the imbalances in the combat are on full display. More so now that you're dying a lot. To the point where even the open zone has its share of snags. And with half the currencies rendered useless, a chunk of the explorative charm is taken from us as well. I would say this is more of a side grade, if anything. Some things are better, some are worse, but most of it is the same game. Worth playing for the novelty, I'm definitely glad it's here, I don't regret what I played, but it falls very short of what a hardcore mode can be. Instead of going in and carefully retooling enemy patterns, platforming challenges, and item locations, they just changed a bunch of numbers around. Take away Sonic's health, his upgrades, lower S rank times, and raise fishing prices. Done. Cut print, please. Let let me go home to my family. I wouldn't be opposed to more elaborate modifications being made in the future. Or some kind of reward for beating the game on the highest difficulty. We don't even get a medal on the title screen for it. As a complete package, though, I thought this update was pretty good. The game is in an objectively better condition now with more content that's entirely optional and free. Even if still flawed, it's a very good start that makes me excited for the coming updates. Until then, thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, don't forget to check out the next episode whenever I post it, which will probably be soon. All right, see ya.